Welcome to Now and Zen. Today's episode features Christopher Otto of the Jack Quartet, composer and violinist living in New York. Uh, the Jack Quartet has performed contemporary music from composers such as Georg Friedrich Haas, Philip Glass, Catherine Lamb, Taishan Sori, and John Zorn. And today, we're here to dive in and talk about intervals, as well as the new album Ragsma and 3x5x7. I've been thinking a lot about different degrees of approximation and like the sort of, um, yeah, I did an undergrad in math as well as music. So I'm, and I'm, I like, you know, learning about number systems and fractions and the ways that different, you know, basically continued fractions or like a uh, series of approximations that can lead you towards someplace. And yeah, just thinking about degrees of fuzziness and ambiguity in microtonality. That's one area that I'm interested in continuing to explore. But I think like ultimately I'm really into the physical effects that these frequencies could have on us in our brains and our perceptions and how different ratios, yeah, can can be embodied, I guess, and and be kind of felt psychologically and the feelings of those intervals. But this is a huge area. You've, uh, you know, pioneered lots of uh, contemporary compositions, you know, Catherine Lamb, John Zorn, have this huge, mm -hmm. impressive list of names. And I'm wondering if a lot of them use J.I., because it seems like a lot of the microtonal stuff I'm hearing, I tried to listen to a lot of the music that the Jack Quartet did, and I did hear shades of J.I. in many places, but I'm wondering what sorts of notation systems you have seen that are unconventional. I know Load Bang also, they are familiar, I think, with J.I. in 72. Like, Well, I can speak to... Yeah, my, my interest is mostly in J.I., and that's actually one of the connecting to this point of approximation, like composers that do work in 72 EDO or other systems or quarter, you just, let's just take quarter tones as a simple example. Um, yeah. Or even 12 tone equal temperament. Um, in our quartet, we tend to interpret things and approximate them in terms of J.I. intervals. So someone wants an equal tempered, you know, neutral third, you know, 11 to nine is an interval that I know very like comfortably. So that will like be an approximation. It's very close to the right number of cents. For me, the rational frequency relationships are very like periodic and very um, tangible and like I can identify them. Yeah. Some practice, but um, yeah, I think we work with a lot of composers who are coming from different systems um, in our quartet, even, you know, just music that's written in 12 tone equal temperament. We just played last night a concert, Taishan Sori's music with him playing. And it was really incredible. It's, it's, you know, um, slow, soft, sustained um, chords, beautiful harmonies. And it's notated as if, you know, traditional 12 tone equal temperament, but the, the subtleties of tuning, I think there's an art to finding the ratios that sort of make sense on a both local scale and then kind of on a global scale as well. And it's not, I don't know, I'm, I'm interested in this kind of balance between rigidity and flexibility. So I don't try to like stick with one system and say, this is the universal system that's going to work for everything. I like to try to figure out how different systems relate and how we can navigate between them. But yeah, you mentioned Catherine Lamb. She's definitely in the J.I. world. And like I've learned so much by playing her music. And in particular, Divisio Spiralis, which is uh, kind of an overtone spectrum of 10 hertz. Um, yeah. And everything, it goes up to, you know, pretty high um, multiples of that in the hundreds. But um, it's all very organically evolving. But anyway, I, I was trying to say like... Um, the regardless of what kind of tuning system a composer comes with when they present a piece to us as a quartet we tend to find a way to hear it or relate it to intervals that we're familiar with like ji intervals like so last night we played taishan stories and i was saying we, we uh you know tuned some of those sonorities um intuitively with with these ratios um mostly five limit probably but the previous night we had some pieces written for us by some younger composers involving quarter tones and 
there's one interval that I didn't know, like between the major second and minor third that uh, like right between like halfway in between them that um, I wasn't sure how to approximate that, but this is sort of an example of how I would go about like learning this equal tempered, like, you know, 250 cent interval. Um, I started by playing both of those notes individually um, in tune with my tuner, an electronic tuner, and in getting them in tune and then playing them as a, a double stop. So I think it was like G or G and A quarter sharp, let's say. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and see what fundamental the tuner thinks is, because the tuner is going to try to hear those two pitches together as one fundamental. And um, it turned oh. out that the uh that it um it it's the tuner so this is one thing i like to think of the tuner as kind of a um a partner a listening kind of partner in a weird way um it's like giving me feedback it's like oh here's the fundamental i'm perceiving and it's uh perceiving those notes as 13 to 15. Ah, so yeah. like, oh okay 13 to 15 i don't really know that interval that well but the way i build it up is okay six to, uh sorry seven to six I know, and eight to seven, I know. Those are super particular ratios, which I think are really the fundamental like kind of building blocks of JI intervals. Yes. And then just taking the mediums of those, which is the when you add the numerators and then add the denominators, you get 15 to 13, which is between them. And it's sort of like the, the sweet spot and the dissonance curve, like between those, you know, like I, I know this resonance and i know this resonance so halfway where is it halfway in between them what does 15, 15 to 13 sound like and then i got to know that interval and then like okay so now i have a reference point for this quarter tonal interval that i didn't really know before um and then i could go further uh, the next level of approximation might be 22 to 19 or whatever um and i and if i subtly change my interval i can actually get the tuner to read uh, a fundamental as if it's 22 to 19 and so on. So it's kind of, it's kind of fun to play with that. Wow. That's really ridiculous that you could use a tuner to kind of figure out what a low fundamental is supposed to be. I've never even thought of that as a trick and as a, you know, someone who looked at a little bit of psychoacoustic stuff, I probably have uh, misremembered that like a lot of that sensation can come from like the brain basically and not something in the physical world. But I know you get that sensation yeah. too when you like play um two notes on electric guitar and they're completely distorted. And then if you tune them really uh, precisely, this is something I'll do with my microtonal electric guitar. I'll like bend notes to hear different fundamentals like popping out. It also fascinates me that you mm -hmm. use um JI to do that because um I'm very backwards from you. And I, uh, exactly. I use equal temperament a lot. I know, I know. Yeah. And a lot of people use temperaments to approximate JI. And so, for example, 72 tone um, is pretty common as an approximation for five lim or seven limit, actually 11 limit um, yeah. JI. It worked pretty well um, for five, seven and 11. And, but then we end up doing the reverse, approximating irrational numbers with rational numbers rather than <laughs> right yeah but well, you can also approximate rational numbers with other rational numbers so like if if someone if you know a piece in Catherine lamb like is calling for 29 to 19 actually no this was another piece that i it was written in ji hedgy notation which i i i really like um mark sabat and wolfgang von Schweinitz's you know system that that kind of like was my path into notating all this stuff but it's like 29 to 19 geez um but then like break it down into like what's the next simplest you know rational approximation to that and what's the next one and then like kind of like find those spots and that's so there's different degrees of approximation then as you like it's always contextual like how one of our like in our quartet uh things we talk about is pgi or pretty good intonation which is just <laughs> yeah. like um Basically, duration divide uh, duration gives us the margin of error that we have. So if it's like fast notes, like sixteenths at core equals one twenty, that's eight hertz 
of uh, of a margin of error. Like so, and 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 it depends on how high or low it is in terms of how many cents it is. If it's so, if you have something like Beethoven's uh, Pastoral Symphony and the storm section, the basses are like going super fast, super low. Um, if you actually calculate like how fast those notes are and how low they are in Hertz, like you get intervals of like a third or a fourth or something that you can basically not even tell right? like right. what pitch is down, you know, at that speed and that low, but, um, but the more sustained you get and the longer you have, the more precision you have. So the more, um, you can really tell the difference between things. So it, it's, it's useful to really contextualize, you know, at, and think of tuning as kind of this dynamic process that as we're like listening together, um, we're really creating something, we're creating information and like our ears are like trying to figure out what's going on in real time. I've never even, um, well, I, I mean, I have considered this, but not in a serious way like you have. The idea that some pitches are so low that if you play fast, you may not even be able to perceive them. Like that's a very, <laughs> yeah, that's a very helpful uh, connection to make, and probably a good example of one of those connections that can easily be forgotten if you just treat pitch you know, like you're in an undergraduate music theory class and you're learning that 12 tone equal temperament is the only thing in the world. Um, yeah. you know, you ignore all those other things, but they, they can all add up and, and matter and you can exploit them. What would you say are some of the challenges of playing this kind of like, uh, microtonal music, uh, with a group? In any kind of group context, tuning is a, a process of, kind of synchronization i think it, i it also relates to rhythm and like fi um finding the balancing different compromises basically that's something like i you know it's i'm, I'm always evolving on uh you know i've played in a string quartet for almost 20 years now and i've played violin for a long long time but it's really striking to me how the art is really in how you balance these different compromises. So we have to, like, there is an ideal, like, it's great to have an ideal of pure, like a pure fifth. Like, what does that actually sound like? And just sustain Lamont Young style. Like, I went through that whole process and like really choosing an interval and sustaining and like having this vision of like absolute purity and almost heaven in a way. But, um, in the reality of the moment to moment tuning, um, you're you're balancing that ideal with what with all these other factors like uh the, the long-term harmonic trajectory. And so it's it's a hard thing to to teach. I'm trying to start with JI. I like to start with a JI analysis as like of get like let's say i'm given a score i'm looking at um how, how would i tune it um i would look at the collections of pitches that are happening vertically um on a starting with a very like slicing it you know chord by chord and like what is the ideal tuning of this like where where are the fifths where are the thirds how can i optimize the, or i mean depending on the uh musical effect it's, it's hard to generalize, but I might be trying to minimize the overall beating. In, a, in other words, making it as consonant and resonant as possible. Um, maybe that's not the goal in a particular context, but let's say that's the goal. Um, then looking for, okay, well, we know there are going to be paradoxes when we try to tune things like horizontally, uh, vertically and horizontally at the same time. You know, there can be... Yes. Have conflicting goals so we may have to make these compromises um but in ji you can identify exactly where those commas are happening basically the comma shifts and say okay um well let's let's tune it this way but then there's going to be a and i try to keep the commas like really small like 10 cents or less maybe um yeah it depends on the like, context, of course, but like a lot of times you can, you can use like the schisma and stuff like that to, um, to create some solutions or 
you know, use vibrato or whatever if you need to um, hide the compromises. But yeah, it's just so hard to generalize. But it's, um, I do think like learning what the ideal is and then learning what factors are influencing it. It's kind of like these forces, gravitational forces that are pulling you, that there are forces pulling a note downward and forces pulling it upward. And just learning to hear all the partials, what partials are beating, what partials are most prominent, what difference tones are happening. Can we make the difference tones stronger, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. It, so much goes into not just um, hearing, you know, individual notes in a chord, but kind of like being able to hear the timbre of a sound as well. If you're like listening to particular partials and then trying to get notes to balance with that. And I also, you know, I see the, um, the strong influence of like uh, being able to train an interval by using slow sustained tones, not only as like a, a helpful pedagogical tool, but also as like um, as a sort of an aesthetic thing as well, like in music that uses those long sustained textures where you really like get the mm -hmm. feel of the chords and you can absorb them. It's really interesting to hear that the schisma can be a bridge um, for someone who has experience really in J.I. music, because um, recently I've been talking a lot about Hedgy, actually. I was using it uh, in a project, and I was like, oh, wait, are there no enharmonic equivalents? So I was like, you know, I usually like to spell things pretty triadically, and so with equal temperament, uh -huh. it's really nice, because you can always re-spell so you have a triad if you wanted a major chord, or, you know, uh, re-spell to your heart's content, depending on the tuning, um, and, uh, you know, the notation system. Yeah. But, um... I think with Hedgy, uh, I, I got some uh, suggestions for respelling, including using like a tilde for the schisma. I, I guess I'd love to hear some yeah. of your thoughts on Hedgy and whether you think it's a, a solid notation system, the the current notation system, like the most popularly used one, and whether mm -hmm. you think the schisma is a is a good tool for respelling. Of course, it depends on your needs as a musician and composer or whatever. I like Hedgy. It makes sense to me as a string player having the fifths be spelled pure as opposed to um, Johnston notation where <laughs> A to D is not a fifth. Um, but <laughs> that um, aside from that, like I like to see the functionality of the notes, like every prime having its own symbol and not uh, questioning, not having to rederive like if i if something is written to um the nearest 12th tone or something i i might need to do some math to figure out okay is this note that i'm playing supposed to be the fifth partial of this or the seventh partial of that or what like and these different things are being conflated together now the thing with head like i so i like hedgy but of course there are going to be a lot of cases where i'm actually yeah interested in almost breaking the system and and like Yes. pushing lots, lots of people want to break it you know break ji <laughs> and like push it to the extreme where it and it becomes cluttered like you can get to a place where you have tons and tons of accidentals um and it gets confusing so then you do want to respell or you you can respell and i i've used that in some of my pieces like ragsma which is this album that i put out on gray fade with joe bransford's label um yes yeah, and that one is modulating by 4375 to 4374, the ragisma, which is the smallest super particular seven limit ratio. And respelling, I mean, it's technically JI, but it, after a while, it just becomes so remote that the ratios would be absurd. Yeah. So it's perceptually that's the that's the whole point is like you start to perceptually re you know approximate it as something else something simpler um so i i notated that um that piece by respelling that's an example where i use the regisma which is 0 0.4 cents um <laughs> to respell a note that would have a bunch of syntonic commas and stuff and septimal hooks to something else so that it would simplify it um and you can do that with a schisma uh yeah i think we first in our quartet like noticed that in like brahms and schubert and composers like that use the enharmonic shifts um from like g sharp major to a flat major and stuff like that and the schisma actually is really helpful for that um so yeah like you can use you can just say okay here i'm 
here's the technical spelling of this note and here's how I'm respelling it so that it will simplify visually. Um, and that has to be that there's kind of an art to that as well. And just figuring out what's the bright balance between visual simplicity and clarity versus showing exactly the technical derivation of everything. So Mark Sabat has done that in some of his pieces too, where he respells certain things. Um, yeah, I haven't heard of the tilde for the schisma actually, but that, that sort of makes sense. And you can just say like, okay, um, D flat syntonic up is now going to be a C sharp Pythagorean or something um, with a tilde. Is that what, how you would use it? Yeah, I think you could use it like that. And then I think the implication would also be if you had the tilde that if you wanted to get really precise, you could say that that accidental is, you know, a schisma away from another note. And that's what the accidental indicates. So that like tilde C sharp is actually like D flat up and C sharp yeah. is actually C sharp. So then you don't lose the uniqueness of each note, but you can still yeah. respell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do want to use that two cents, like, and have like super sustained thing and like try to hear the, the two cent difference you could, but uh, it also simplifies it. Yeah. That's one of those cases again, where it like really depends on the context and the degree of approximation that you want. And, you know, for some composers, it might just be too much. I, th I think with Hedgy, like I've seen, I don't like, I'm not trying to proselytize for that, but I do like <laughs> it. And I, I kind of do actually try to convert composers to it. When when people get started with it, they often have trouble um, with those spelling dilemmas because we're so used to enharmonically respelling, like, oh, well, three major thirds should equal an octave. And, you know, yeah. um, just like common sense things that we're trained with, like, oh, no, that's not true. We have to, like, actually think about the Pythagorean comma and the deasis and all that. So it forces you to really think about what notes you want. And then if if it ends up being too complicated visually, like you end up stacking a lot of accidentals. Let's say it's, again, with the PGI, fast note, like 30 second notes. And like, you're not going to put 15 accidentals on every note. So <laughs> let's figure out what degree of approximation makes the most sense. And if it's like a, a harmonic area, like, okay, this is all C overtones, then that's really easy and like you can just sort of say that in the score um but if it's i do like to know where the notes are coming from and if it's if i just see a bunch of random you know approximations i'm like okay i, I can do this but i um i'm just curious about where the notes come from and like what the deriv derivation is you know if you were quite clever and had some strange needs you could want to respell notes with commas that uh, people don't use very often. I mean, here we are just talking about the schisma and the regisma, but you know, of course, all you math nerds out there know that there are many, <laughs> many, many other ones um, that could be valid as well. Yeah, and this happened like so uh, a few years ago. the The whole reg ragsma piece that I wrote based on the regisma, I got fascinated because I Jack. Quartet, we were playing this piece by Vicente Atria Hansen. He was studying at Columbia at the time, and he, he had this piece that I was working with him to translate into Hedgy, and it was one of these things where it was just modulating like crazy, so it was gonna end up being absolutely insane looking, um, unless we respelled by these commas. And I kept like writing down the comma, like, what what are we respelling by? Oh, and I, I was actually using all these commas, like all of these like mathematical curiosities you see on the internet, like, oh, when was, when would anyone think that that's useful to know? Like, no, it was actually useful. And I was like telling him, okay, we're respelling this by this. It's, you know, less than five cents or whatever. And here's the ratio. Um, and that's how like the regisma came up in that piece. It was like, here's the modulation, here it is. And, like, and then I and then I started thinking, okay, what if I built a piece around this interval? Yeah. Um, and just like allow that modulation to happen. You're playing with, you know, uh, standard acoustic instruments, but you're dealing with differences of less than a cent. And that precision is all happening in 
uh, just intonation-based language. So I'm guessing part of the possibility of that can be attributed to like the fact that you're playing slow, steady tones. Am I understanding that the description right and that like if you have quartets one and two and quartet three is a bridge, that quartets one and two they spread apart by a regisma very slowly. They drift by a regisma via moving by J.I. ratios, right? Did you just respell yeah. it each time it had moved by a regisma? Was it different every time? How did you approach the notation? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll send you the sc- I mean, um, I, uh, yeah, I think it's on my website too, but the, I, I'm, I'm pretty bad with like really uh, updating the website and the scores, but basically yeah i spell i respelled it every time it went through a full uh cycle of the regis it's just modulating by so i took the prime factorization of that ratio um it's a product of twos threes fives and sevens calculated and time. i just chained together um so each instrument comes with a ratio of like two to one or three to one or five to one or seven to one or one or the inversions of those to the previous note um and the next player comes in with their note. It's always like a, a, one of those ratios. And they end up um, getting uh, this regisma away. And at that point, I've got a stack of accidentals. So it's a, it starts on an A and then it ends up on an A um, quartet one. Um, I don't want to mess up the spelling now off the top of my head. But basically, I just respell by the regisma. Um yeah. And I write an asterisk on it. I, I don't know, like, yeah, I don't know if it's the best notation, but I just, um, it was a thing where I was doing it for a recording as well. Like it could in theory be done live with the, um, but it would be, have to be so, I mean, it's, um, like you said, it's 0.4 cents. So it's, it's really unreasonable to like expect that to work in live performance with, um, with the first two quartets drifting, by that amount but it worked for a recording and then the third quartet is is more about this approximation and like finding the the th- the fundamental the perceptual kind of fundamental anyway i think it's sort of hard to break out of these systems that we get ingrained in and like ask the larger questions like uh you know if we don't necessarily mm. have an o- overarching system for everything or if uh some kind of music allows for more intonational flexibility than other kinds I'd really love to know the nature of how Ragsma is drifting, kind of the speed and the rationale. I know you respell, of course. When you're respelling like A and then A or Ragsma higher, is that A or Ragsma higher? Is it like uh, doing like a chord cycle that's the same like every time it drifts Ragsma away, or are the chords always wow. different? It's um slightly different. I think of it um. The way I visualized it is kind of a four dimensional grid, right? Like the, because yeah. it was four primes, two, three, five, and seven, each is kind of a dimension. Although two and seven are only used, I think they only have one prime factor. So, like, it's mostly about three and five. Um, so, I, I, I sort of visualize it as this like grid that I'm navigating through and I'm making my way from this pitch to that pitch. And there are each iteration of this cycle is a little bit different from what I remember, like based on the instruments and like the, um, the register, I would choose whether, so I have a choice basically of this, these factors, what order to do them in. Like I could do the two go up an octave first and then go down a fifth or do the fifth first and then the octave, all the possible orderings. I don't think I did like a full on like permutational approach to those. I I sort of just navigated through that space for what works like yeah. orchestrationally and that kind of thing. But it's basically you have to get from a, point A to point B and just order these factors such that all the notes can be played by the instruments. I also wonder, of course, how fast the drift is occurring because it's such a darn small distance and i want to say i was listening to it again mm. today and maybe around like six like six minutes in i noticed there was a little bit of wolfiness that seemed to come from drifting apart so it makes me think that either i am noticing more that than i would normally give myself credit for or it cycles like really fast like maybe like every i don't know 20 seconds or something it's like uh if you had to estimate how, yeah. how far would you say you know it's traveling and all that kind of thing 
Yeah, well, it's that's a great question because there's kind of like multiple levels of drift, but I don't want to overcomplicate it. So basically, our uh, audience loves that. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> um, I think it's around a minute. I'll I can check the score, but I think it's around a minute, and I think there's around twelve to fourteen regismas that are navigated through over the course of the track of each track. Ah. So the top, um, I think. Quartet one goes like 12 up or something and quartet two goes 14 down. Um, so that so they they're end going up... at different rates too. Oh yeah. They're, they're, so, oh. Oh, that, yeah, that's actually the other oh, drift. So there is a kind of six to seven um, polyrhythm of the speed at which they're going through these. So they, yeah, you, you, f they actually line up back. So they start on a, and then, um, by the time they get back to the A, it's sound. It still sounds exactly like an A, pretty much. I mean, it's 0. Yeah. 0.4 cents up, 0. 0.4 cents down. One is a little bit delayed. Um, so, but by the end of the piece, that last A is, um, let me think, I guess it would be something like 26 regismas wide or something. So it's probably around... 13 cents, I think. I, I, that sounds about right. I, so it's perceptually different. Oh, you figured it out. Okay, 10 cents off. Yeah. 10.4. If I uh, take 0.4 and multiply it by uh, 26. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so that by the end of the piece is perceptual, but you're saying by six minutes. The thing is, um, the A's. The regisma is never really heard like super clearly as such. It's just, um, it's a device to get all these modulations happening and the drift, like there's a lot of moments in the piece where I just like, don't know what, the, what the pitch even is. Like it's, it's very close to being in tune, but it could be some crazy ratio, um, apart. So, ah, uh, yeah, but that's, it. yeah, it's like perceptually drifting, in different ways, like there's different levels of beating. So I think about the different levels of beating, the slowest beating is when we are one regisma part. And I think one beat of the regisma at a 440 or whatever is pretty slow. It's like a few seconds long. Um, and that like, that moment does occur, but it's just so tucked into it that it's not really a feature of it. But then you have like faster beating that are like one to two hertz that result from, you know, once we've gotten you know, later in the piece, probably you're we talking about six or seven minutes in, we've gotten to that one or two hertz where we can really start to hear a slow beating um, developing. And then, then there's like, of course, like faster beating that develops because of like, let's say these two quartets are on these different trajectories and halfway through their paths, they've reached some kind of weird quarter tonal land, but through different paths, but they're yes. pretty close. They might be like five hertz off or 10 hertz off. Here's an example of an early section where things are mostly in tune between quartets one and two. And here's an example of a similar progression later where things have drifted. You can hear the justness between some intervals in similar registers. From each other. So there's all these degrees from like less than a hertz to like 20 hertz, like super fast beating that just sort of like, I like the way that they it just sort of happens in the piece. Like I didn't control every moment that way. I was just like setting these quartets on their journeys and letting them go and then see what kind of sonorities come out. Yeah. And I have, um, actually I have a newer piece. I have a piece I wrote a couple of years ago, still haven't recorded it, but it's based on the Chalmersia, which is a one, I think it's 123, 201 to 123 200 it's the smallest super particular 13 limit ratio 
Oh my. 123. So it's zero point like zero one cents, I think. Wow. It's like absurdly much smaller than the regizma. And um, but I just pump that comma out like um much faster. So like in right. 15, I think it's 15 or 20 seconds rather than a minute. And then I do it for like three hours to yeah. the point. Um, so like I I it's orchestrated as two quintets. Um, and I made a sign tone version of it that I've been listening to. I can send you sometime, but it's, yes. it's fun to listen to like, cause they also do a rhythmic drift as well. They're like, it's designed so that you, we can record it and then um, just time stretch or like, um, yeah, time stretch and pitch shift at the same time so that the rhythmic drift and pitch drift happens. You think like, oh, this, this is a completely absurd 0.01 cents, but like you start to really perceive those super slow beats, at least with sign yeah. tones and then developing into, and I don't know, I just like that, that feeling of these modulations that you feel like you're returning home in a way, but it's never really home. It's like slightly off. And um, yeah. I'm just fascinated by these ideas of like, things that are identity, like kind of false identities, like in in one sense, they're the same, but in another sense, they're not. And like keeping track of like how we've got, how we've gone on this journey and arrived back it feels different. That's uh, one re reason I really like uh, equal temperament. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I create things that are related to just intonation, but sometimes um, the question is like, how is this like a progression that someone might normally hear in a certain way um, changed so that all the intervals add up wrongly? And such and such interval actually ends up being such and such interval. I was also going to mention like what I've been working on, aside from like these kind of um, drifting pathways, I'm working on this album now with Joe at Gray Fade called 3 by 4 by 5 by 7 which is um, also related in that it connects sort of the pitch and rhythm domains and the beating and all that stuff, but it's mm -hmm. not so much about drift directly it's more of like a self-contained universe system of pitches like all based on like kind of i think it's 0.1 hertz um yeah and like overtones of that and how to create kind of structures that span from rhythm all the way into pitch and like using different tones of different tones of different tones and all that Yeah, I was hearing some really interesting uh, timbres coming from the file you sent me. I listened to the one that mm -hmm. had the term load bang on it. I don't know if it's them playing it or if it's like a mock-up or whatever. Yeah, the second track is them playing. I mean, it's a quartet, but they, uh, it's nine copies of them, I think, in canon with themselves. So that you can get the beating and stuff, yeah. You're very familiar with that uh, locked-in feeling that you get from just intonation. Of course, I can tell because I listened to your violin octet and it immediately it hit me just how locked into place it all was. Because I've heard lots of things that are locked in, but usually mm -hmm. it has to be from a computer for it to hit exactly like a brick wall, like to almost be, almost be a little bit uncomfortable because it's like too perfect. I wonder if there's any advice you have for people who want to create locked in just sounds that may relate to things like uh, panning or volume or which pitches should be louder than other ones, balance, that kind of thing. If you, if you have any advice for hmm. our JI heads out there. The Violin Octet was like my first real piece that I felt really good about when I was writing in J.I. For, for a long time, I was doing things in J.I. where it was more um, 
I was really into like Babbitt and Zanakis and Serial, like just like having tons of notes and fast structures and, and working it out. And then when I got into the violin octet world, I just wanted to like really lock in these dyads and these structures that ideally as it get, goes on in the piece, I wanted to try to get the beatings to like almost line up. I mean, I've never really been able to like totally phase lock the beatings because like it's just so like on a violin uh strings just the tiniest change you know the up bows versus the down bows and so on i can only i can speak to the violin at least it's a really great exercise in just like bow control and realizing how much control you have of the pitch with the right hand and the bow and then the left hand is actually very slightly you know kind of compensating for those uh changes in the right hand but it's it's really a mental thing like if i know like what i'm listening for and exactly how i'm what i'm focusing on and i really put my attention there as i'm playing then like that's how i was able to get those heads of uh, those locked in oh i guess uh, um i also used uh sign tones when i was listening like i had sign tones in my headphones mixed in with my own sound but yeah, it's interesting because like, it also made me more aware of the inharmonicity of the violin, like the very slight, like it's quite close to the harmonic series. There was like one interval, you know, it's constructed out of these dyad or double stops. Um, every note is like an open string with scordatura and like a stop note. And I think it was something like, uh, it was on, on paper sh should be a 10 to 11. Like it was part of some overtone series. Let's, let's say it was 10 to 11. So I should have had the 11th partial of my lower note matching my 10th partial of the upper note. If, um, but because those partials are slightly off, what I found is that if I'm playing in tune with a sign tone, rather than those partials matching, it was the it was effectively like an 11 to 12. So it was the 12th note of the huh. lower one matching the 11th of the upper one. So it's like, do I consider that a 10 to 11 or an 11 to 12? Because 10 to 11 by the sign, like the frequency according to the sign tone, is it's 10 to 11. But according oh. to my own instrument's interval structure, it's an 11 to 12. And yeah. like I had to make that kind of like weird trade-off choice. Um, but in general, yeah, the... Uh, to get those locked in sounds like a lot of practice um, with sign tones and yeah, just developing control. But I think like there's an interesting space where it's not perfectly. And I think Lamont Young, I was really influenced by uh, him and um, working with the cellist, Charles Curtis, um, who works with Lamont Young a lot. And it's like really taught me to like slow down and like just realize how much is going on in a very simple interval all the partials that are happening it's like my own mind is being reflected in the sound in some weird way like i'm so focused on this particular harmonic or difference tone or whatever that i feel like my degree of attention or what i'm listening to is somehow being reflected in the sound and it's a really active like even though it seems static in a certain sense it's it's also very dynamic with violin in harmonicity what exactly is the nature of that do you find that it's something like the partials are stretched out as you get higher like how exactly does that work and is it different for high and low pitches honestly that's a great question that i should know more like details but i i haven't measured very rigorously all of this stuff yeah i i, I don't want to i hesitate to say something wrong i think the upper partials probably go sharp but i do notice different strings i don't usually measure the partials with the tuner but i think i've checked some 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 partials are a little flat actually and it does depend on the string and how fresh it is and or versus old and yeah like i said the thing about the tuner i try to use the tuner as a tool to tell to help like how it's perceived uh tell me how it's perceiving all the partials and information but also use my ears at the same time as the kind of ultimate authority in a way 
getting used to hearing the different partials and like what beating is happening and what's most prominent. It's kind of like, that's, I would say the main um, skill I'm trying to develop. And yeah, like I said, I haven't really measured all the individual partials to see how far out. I'm kind of curious though. What do you think is the hardest thing you've ever had to play in terms of pitch language um, with the quartet or by yourself? Oh, uh, the hardest thing. Um, I mean, I still think Catherine Lamb's Divisio Spiralis is up there, and, and I love the piece. It's one of my favorites. You know, we've done it a number of times now over the last four years and recorded it, but it always strikes me how crazy. I mean, just like it is hearable, um, but there's yeah, there's just these collisions of harmonies where finding certain notes can be just so challenging, but it needs to be the anchor for the next section. So it needs to be in tune. So we, we do, um, we've, I usually perform it with the tuner. The four of us have different approaches. Sometimes we rehearse with tuners, sometimes without, sometimes when you're seeing the tuner giving you that feedback, it can be like, take it feels like it might take away from the musicality or just being able to listen and not just kind of ignore it but I've tried to like learn how to ignore the tuner when I need to just really focus on tuning as an ensemble and then use the tuner for certain moments that like I need to just be an anchor but yeah that that's one of the hardest pieces and I think yeah I learned I've learned so much from working on it they're, you know, all just the beautiful, the beauty of the, the numbers, the, the whole number is like, you know, and these little ratios like 91 to 90 and 78 to 77, little motions that happen at different points. It's, uh, it's just so fascinating to me how like the tiniest interval or like a small change can really create a huge like emotional effect small like frequency difference can make a big i have uh, an app on my phone that shows me um prime factors of any numbers so i'm seeing what those ones that you mentioned were oh 91 to 90 91 is 7 times 13 and 90 is a five limit one so i Mm -hmm. guess um another thing i'm wondering about of course is how high ratios can kind of be tuned on their own which is another common question i know that isoharmonic chords can also be a little bit different and different tones you know are their own thing i've heard that mark sabat has worked with things like 25 limit but i didn't know uh, you mentioned a 29 limit ratio for Catherine lamb's piece right so uh yeah that piece does have a 29 it has like yeah it's <laughs> I think it's like a chord that has 34 it's like 34 to 29 so it's seven it involves 17 and 29 um yeah but they're built like passing tone like to me um some of these things relate to something i'm still trying to work on and understand is more like the additive the relationship between the additive relationships in frequencies versus the multiplicative ones so mm-hmm. Like 17, I guess a good example is when I got to play in the Lamont Young Trio for Strings. This is also a piece that really had a big impact on me when I first heard it um, in undergrad.
ostensibly it's like only uses primes two, three, and 17 in the tuning. And the 17 is, you find as a, well, when you have the eight to nine really locked in, a summation tone of 17, um, it's sort of, or like the octaves of eight and nine are 16 and 18. So if you have those, you can kind of really tuck the 17 right in the middle in a, such a way that the beating between the 17 to 16 and the 18 to 17 equalizes. So that's how the 17 sort of manifests. It's not like, it's a weird note because it's so normal, but like norm, 17 and 19 just sound like kind of normal <laughs> equal number pitches almost. So it's hard to yeah. feel like they're really just intonation. But um, I found that really interesting to like, to how to hear how to the really the right sweet spot for a 17 or 19 or something on that level. And when you mentioned Mark Sabat and the 25, like sometimes I'm confused by 25, you said 25 limit, but. Oh, it's an odd limit. Yeah. Talk about the harmonic or the um, prime limit or the 25 is like. Yeah. I, weird, I, but... I suppose I was uh, having to reference uh, odd limit since 25 is in a prime number. I think uh, the comment had to do with tuning right. intervals by ear. Like Mark Sabat has tuned 25 odd limit intervals by ear, just like in mm. isolation. Yeah, yeah, yeah essentially yeah i don't know that i can i think in the right circumstances i could i can find some of those higher ones i haven't really tried to train myself to go much beyond 17 and 19 and 23 are like kind of it's really contextual i think if the right mm -hmm. harmonic context if i have a nice overtone chord built up and i'm just like laying down the next partial Sometimes it'll feel like, oh, I can I can hear it, I can lock it in. But if it's just isolated, it can be really hard to distinguish in, from something simpler. I like the the list of tunable intervals that Mark and, and Wolfgang and, and so on have developed. Yes. Um, I think it's a good like starting point. And I I'm also interested in trying to go beyond because I always like pushing things, but also just like really refining my understanding of the, of those basic intervals and like how they can stack. My point is basically it's very contextual and like what I might be able to play a 23 to 19 in some contexts, but other contexts I would have no clue. Right, it's yeah. sort of like how supportive is the environment for that interval and how like, you know, in the Lamont Young example, the 17, you know, if I, if I really have the eight, nine there solid, then I feel like I can do the 17. But if you just asked me to play a 17 to 16 right now on my violin, I wouldn't be a hundred percent confident. I guess uh, one uh, qu other question I just uh, thought of um, is, uh, would you, have you seen equal temperament notation for any kind of um, like tuning that is sort of in a smaller area than 72, but not really like 12 times an integer? So something like 19 tone equal temperament or 31 tone equal temperament. Mm -hmm. um, would you be, would you be open to working with those sorts of things? I mean, as a string player, it's like hard to conceptualize. I mean, it's like, yeah, I, I would be, first of all, yes, I'm open to anything. And like, I guess the, the advantages of that are if you're into kind of more, like I, I love 12 tone music and and serial music as well so like if you're going to yeah. do something more like that where you need the symmetries of 19 or 31 it gives you a lot of possibilities um but i would probably <clears throat> you know like 31 you know is kind of like a mean tone quarter comma close to quarter comma mean tone right um yeah so i'd like the Basically, I would like, I would know that the major thirds are pure ish and, and um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then I might, I might contextually look for 
rational approximations, but then also know that they should, in theory, be equal equal steps. So try to find that balance of like using my ear, like melodically, maybe you might want to use the, um, yeah, the 31, the equality and the symmetries of that. I mean, if I had like a, a mock-up and or a sign tone to practice with, and that's like also a really useful tool. Yeah. But um, I often will take like, for example, recently I've been taking Vicentino, some Vicentino pieces, which are written it with like, I don't totally understand. It's basically quarter tones, but like 31 tones to the octave keyboard and oh, like I've seen those. basically, yeah, you can do it with two manuals, but in a string quartet, we, I've converted it to basically just intonation. And this is one of the fun things is like kind of figuring out how the voice leading, it's very triadic chord by chord, but they're always, they're displaced by quarter notes. So there's these really weird voice leading. And for example, the voice, this is the same kind of voice leading I use in my three by four by five by seven is, um, let's say you're going from a like perfect fourth to a major third in contrary motion. Uh -huh. basically like quarter tones, but um, you want it in just intonation, you want them to move by the same frequency amount um, rather than the same like ratio. Mm. Um, then you end up with basically a 27 to 28 and a 35 to 36. Um, and because you have 36 to 27 being a four to three and 35 to 28 being a five to four. Yeah. Um, so they're moving by different amounts in freak in, in pitch space, but in frequency space, they're moving by the same amount. So I, oh. I do everything in this. So everything is super particular ratios horizontally, even though it's like not symmetrical in the in the pitch domain, it is sort of symmetrical in, in frequency. Here's the 24 tet resolution. And here's the just one. It locks in more, yeah. and it's not that different. Um, but it does, it gives you a range of instead of like the thirty one tone, the like one thirty first of a octave that ends up getting mapped to a bunch of different ratios, like ranging from I think um, twenty seven to twenty eight, thirty five to thirty six, and I think at one point I had to even use forty eight to forty nine. Yeah. Because, yeah, just contextually, like, I wanted to have the triads really in tune justly. Um, yeah. But anyway, like, I think comp there's also, like, you can compose in 31 or 19 or whatever, and then also perform an additional, either the composer or us as performers might perform an additional process to sort of, like, integrate it, those systems into our bodies and our instruments so that it, you know, feels good to play. Um, yeah. That's that's an interesting challenge. I haven't really explored them that much, but I'm curious. Uh, enough people are starting to use them that we're seeing, you know, multiple, maybe large works in various equal tunings emerge, and people are very passionate about defending particular notation systems that either they've uh, invented or they have a stake in, or they think the logic for this notation system is better than that one. Personally, mm -hmm. I think it's usually pretty helpful to, like, create a circle of fifths within a particular equal tempered tuning system with some glaring exceptions because there's some tunings that have fifths that aren't close to three over two um and if those uh tuning systems exist most times you can actually notate them as a subset of a higher tuning so like 16 tone equal temperament is a great example you may uh, know this mathematical fact already uh being a math person i first saw it in a theory book in easley blackwood's the structure of uh diatonic tunings i think is what it's called um the idea that for 36 tone equal temperament and above every equal temperament gives you a diatonic scale and thus you can use that for notation um so mm. the only problem ones then are ones that are below Especially um, multiples of five and seven are particularly interesting because for multiples of seven, a circle of fifths renders sharps and flats completely redundant if you want to keep the logic. Like F and F sharp would be the same. Oh. You just have to use arrow accidentals entirely, which yeah. is weird, but it's fine. I think it's yeah. okay. 
uh, for the five tone equal temper ones, a five tone circle of fifths is a little bit different. And there's already a precedent that's been established by Easley Blackwood using 15 tone equal temperament, where it's a five tone circle of fifths notated, and then arrow accidentals with any in between notes. But I personally, actually, I wanted to ask you this. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard of people using 10th tones or 60 tone equal temperament other than just to notate 10, 15, 20, or 30 tone equal temperament as kind of like a subset of it. Like I, I haven't heard of that at all, but I feel like it could be a good solution if enough people were used to it because it would, what it would do is if you were thinking uh, broadly about wanting to use maybe most of these tunings at some point, it would give 10, 15, 20, and 30 like a similar logic. And I think 20 is extremely ghastly if you don't notate it as a subset of 60. Um, with 15, 15 is interesting, because with 15, you can survive with it being native fifth notation or being a subset of 60. But with 20, you know, it's just, the qualities aren't as clear, so it doesn't make sense. It's not as close to what you would see in J.I., where you just have like C, E down, G being a major chord. 15 tone native oh. fifth notation preserves that. And 20 tone has neutral triads that are jank, so it doesn't. So like you're talking about 60 tone temperament yes. being like a, a super, the, the big set, and then like taking 30 and 20 and 15 because they're factors of 60, looking at how those can fit within 60. Yes, that would be oh. a really neat solution. It would, of course, miss... Uh, 25 tone equal temperament, and 35 is um, particularly frightening since it's a combination of 7 and 5 and has no diatonic scale of its own. It's kind of like the final boss, I think. The thing is, I'm used to learning a lot of different notations and like relearning what things mean, but it's, as I get older, it's getting hard. I think it's getting harder to like re... I mean, in my mind, I often will end up translating something into something I'm more familiar with, like I said, a hedgy note or something, if I were to be confronted with one of these systems as, as a violin player. But like, of course, if you're doing synth, you know, synthesis or computer music or fretted instruments or keyboard instruments, there's all kinds of things that, that that's not even an issue. Yeah. Right. I gotta ask what uh, John Zorn is like. Man, he is like his music very much. Like he's got this <laughs> manic energy. Like he, he's now 70 years old and like still has like more excitement, enthusiasm um, than like almost anyone I know. And he's so enthusiastic about his own music. I mean, it sounds like, I don't know, maybe it sounds narcissistic to say it this way, but he just really genuinely reacts to hearing his own music, especially for the first time, and he will just like explode, shout, and cry, literally cry tears, and like, he's wow. just really like emotional. But I think he's, I mean, he's calmed down a bit more recently. I haven't seen him explode in anger lately. Um, but he's, you know, he's got this rage. I mean, his Zorn means kind of like rage in German. That's, I think it's a funny coincidence, but luckily I'm on his good side. So <laughs> good for you. Uh, I haven't pissed him off, but he's great. I, he really loves, I think he really believes in the power of music and art. And um, it's like a very spiritual thing. It's, it's very mysterious. We recorded all of his quartets and we're that's going to come out next year sometime but um from his earlier pieces and he still does a lot obviously with improvisation and game uh pieces and stuff like that but the the later notated like fully notated stuff still has a lot of the energy and like gestures from that earlier stuff um there was a concert at miller theater in new york a few months ago where he, they uh 
Barbara Hannigan sang a piece of his for uh, and Stephen Gosling. It was a piano and voice piece that he wrote when he was 15. And it was pretty much just like a John Zorn piece. It was like, you know, <laughs> different, multiple languages, multiple styles, multiple Weber and like gestures, aleatoric section, this, this, that. And, but even the fully notated stuff <clears throat> now where everything is very precise, it's like, it's from the same place and kind of energy. And one thing he, he talks about that I, I think about a lot is that it's not about the notes on the page and it's not even about the specific sounds that are coming out, but there's a kind of energy that he wants from the performer and the challenges and the notes are there to inspire this kind of devotion of energy. And so I, like he thinks about the process of practicing, how is it gonna to feel to practice it? And so make that like a good challenge, a fun challenge. And I enjoy like practicing these looks, even though they're really, really hard and he's always pushing things to the edge. I think it's like that energy that translates to an audience and like inspires people rather than the specific sounds. Like if you analyze some of the, you know, the pieces on paper that, you know, some of them you can be like, okay, I get, I get it. But it's, it's more, I think there's more about the energy. Great answer. Uh, I guess he's a passionately polystylistic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he keeps surprising us. Like, sometimes he'll have a piece that's just all quiet and, like, one kind of style the whole way through. It doesn't, like, do the stylistic jump cut thing, but it still feels like his music. What is sort of your history as a composer? I'd also I'd love to know about that yeah. as well. I started, uh, well, I started composing as a kid, really, as long with learning the violin and piano. Um, and got more into it in high school. And I, I listened to new music. I grew up in Champaign, Illinois, and the University of Illinois had, you know, pretty experimental music department. Some of the people there and the concerts were there. I got to hear some like Cage and Zanakis that were really influential on me. I got exposed to Ben Johnston's music there too. Yeah, I went to undergrad at Eastman for composition was my major, along with math at University of Rochester. So I was playing a lot of violin and that ended up being more my like career in terms of my performance is my main like income. I don't really, I found it like going the composer path as like a means of support or like, you know, doing teaching or the academic route I, I found. Like, I didn't feel like I wanted to do that. I wanted to do composing just purely for my own pleasure and fun and, like, just write for my friends. I'm not really that concerned with getting myself out there that much, although maybe at some point. Um, I think, yeah, that kind of frees me to just do only the things that really are interesting to me, um, composing-wise. And, and I'm lucky enough to also have a quartet that, you know, has played some of my pieces. And like I said, I guess I, I went through some phases where I, I, I was really influenced by Zanakis and Babbitt and math. Like I said, with math, um, I mm -hmm. like examining structures. And so I did a lot of that in equal temperament and, and then finding Justin Tenation and kind of Lamont Young's music and was really important to me and kind of, out and I don't know, I found Horatio Radulescu really inspiring too, um, really wild stuff. And then just like, yeah, I've been gradually trying to expand my own sense of what music is, what microtonality and just intonation is and push the boundaries in different ways. I'm still like not, uh, you know, I'm not good at writing melodies necessarily, but like I, I would like to, like I envy people. I, I think like Cat Lamb is again an example of someone I really love the way she approaches things more melodically. And I've always like mostly been doing things from a very kind of vertical, harmonic, and and rhythmic or like formal kind of bird's eye view level. But I want to like keep challenging myself to do some other things and, you know, maybe get back to improvising. I haven't done as much improvising since um, 
since I started like really getting into like, yeah, writing things out on paper and doing programming. So I, when I compose, I like, I like using Mathematica or other tools to sort of like generate structures and then like try to hear them, synthesize them, and then eventually kind of notate them out and play them. But um, I'm curious to try to get more, yeah, I'm developing a piece, you know, for Silla Violin just to like, with a little bit different approach where I'm just like really just playing and using all this stuff. I've, you know, I've generated all of this kind of knowledge and ideas and I like just like discovering patterns and like presenting them. Um, but I would like to challenge myself to try to um, be able to like, yeah, compose more in real time and not, have like for a long time all my pieces it would take me years to you know like develop this whole system and then finally notate it out and i'd finally hear it and then it would be kind of like yeah that was okay maybe next piece i'll you know like that whole process took so long mm -hmm. um but I'm, I'm i'd like to get to a point where i can really kind of just let it flow the thing about john zorn that i'm so inspired by is he's just constantly writing pieces but doesn't have a lot of hangups about, I don't know. Like I, I just like, it takes me so long to write because of this whole involved process, but yeah, that's basically where I'm at. How did you uh, meet uh, other members of the Jack Quartet? Uh, the founding members all went to school together at Eastman. Um, so John and I, John is a violist and I are the founding members and we all um, were playing together a lot of new music and our fellow composers pieces. And there's a student run new music ensemble there called Osea. And we got put together um, to play a piece by Helmut Lachenmann, a quartet and his third quartet. And that was super challenging and exciting and got to work with him uh, in person. And that was sort of the beginning of the quartet um, and just getting to play new music together we it was like never even a question of like what yeah there was there's all this repertoire that we were excited about that wasn't really getting played in the u.s much um so yeah well i'm so glad you guys are doing that i think you've become one of the many friendly faces for you know contemporary classical music and uh i think when people think of people who really want to pioneer that genre and keep living composers relevant. They think of, uh, they think of the Jack Quartet. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm so excited to see all the composers and ideas and music that's being created now and like keeping the tradition alive and the string quartet still has so much to offer, I think. So yeah, glad that we get to do this. Thanks so much for, for coming in to, to talk to me today. I, I learned a lot. Um, and I really appreciate your time. Of course, uh, do you want to say anything about uh, Ragsma or uh, anything else that's coming out? Like, do you have something to like plug at the end? Yeah, check out Ragsma, check out, okay. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll say that, yeah, the album I'm working on, three by four by five by seven, with, will come out on the gray fade. Um, I don't know yet because I'm still, when exactly, because I'm still working on writing up the thing, but it should be, a really great experience. I'm really excited to do that. So, yeah. Uh, great talking to you. Yeah, great to talk to you too. Adios. Okay, see you later. Thanks for listening to Now and Zen, the podcast about microtonal and Zen harmonic music. The music you're hearing is Ragsma by Christopher Otto, performed by the Jack Quartet in two string quartet formations. If you want to help us out, please leave our podcast a review on iTunes and spread the word. Then you can get yourself subscribed so you won't miss any episodes. Now and Zen is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or you can find our RSS feed at nowandzen.libsyn.com. This episode is a pretty fun YouTube video because when the intervals are played in the episode, I also made little cards so that you can see like what the intervals are, so... Maybe if people like that, I'll keep doing it. I think it could be pedagogically helpful. Thanks once again to Christopher for joining us, and thanks to everybody listening. We're here to spread the love of microtones, and you're part of the team.
As always, I'll remind you that we have a Patreon account, and that when we hit the 60 patron mark, now and Zen will create episodes monthly instead of sporadically. The Patreon account contains bonus episodes from the show, sneak peeks and plans, and bonus content about Steven Weigel's music and YouTube account as well. This episode is made possible by the generous support of our patrons, our Zen Harmonic patrons, as well as our Zen Harmonic gods, Naren Rattan, Mike Battaglia, Adam Fries, Matthew Sheeran, Vincenzo Sicarella, Hector McGuffin, Christopher Bailey, Leland O. Weigel, Amy Coleman, Joe Weigel, and Tina Harmon Carto. Catch you next time on Now and Zen.